This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. So, uh, Dr. Claudia Devoto is an archaeologist and a numismatist. After receiving her MA in numismatics from Sapienza and a PhD in ancient topography from the University of Messina, she joined, she joined the Department of Sciences of Antiquity of Sapienza as a postdoc. She participated in several archaeological excavations in Italy, France, and Turkey. Since 2017, she's been one of the co-directors of, uh, of the excavations of Sapienza in the Cilician city of Elaiusa Sebaste. She's also responsible for the gathering of all, which are a lot, of the ancient coins held at Sapienza coming from several excavations under the scientific universe, supervision of the university, including Pompeii and Ostia. So it gives you the idea of how many they are. She is the author of numerous articles and of the monograph Coins of Gnosis uh, between uh, uh, Archaeology and History, which was published in 2022. And I proudly hold my copy here. And uh, then uh, I leave the stage uh, to Dr. Devoto. So thank you, Lucia, for your presentation. I'm very glad to be virtually there and talk about this topic that I did with for a while. And that is, of course, the coinage of Knossos. So before going in depth with it, I would like to spend a word on the title I chose that, as you can see, re reads all data in a new perspective. Well, a corpus of the coins of Knossos does not still exist. But in the meanwhile, I tried to reorganize the data we dispose of, studying on the one hand, <clears throat> the city of Knossos intended as a context that produced the coins. And on the other hand, I pieced up together, or I tried to, the data concerning Cretan coinage and economy in general, with the aim of providing a framework in which put Knossian coinage. As one can imagine, reminding that Crete was labeled as the 100 city island by Homer, we know a lot of cities on the island that minted coins. We can count at least 40 of them. The majority of works concerning Cretan mints, however, is focused on Cretan coinage in general, since there are some phenomena that have been long recognized as widely shared across the island. And we will turn to them in a while. So this means, in turn, that when one, when one luck looks pardon, at the mint of Knossos, there should be a continuous shift from a specific focus on the, sing of, on the single polis, that is Knossos, to a more wider perspective, including the Wolf Island. So going to the history of the studies, <clears throat> the first cornerstone for Cretan coinage is the works of Ioannis Zvoronos, Numismatique de la Crete Ancienne, that was published in 1890. The work was conceived as composed by two parts. The first volume on the left contained the catalog of all the coins issued in Crete that were organized by Mint and preceded by a geographical and historical description, including also information about the local cults. Zvoronos also gathered 1,000 images uh, that were at the at the end of the book in 35 tables. So the plan of Sporonos was to compose a second volume, you have the summary on the right, that was never published and that should have contained some specific studies concerning chronology, countermarks, and overstrikes. The second fundamental work in Cretan coinage was published by Georges Leridaire in 1966, so quite 70 years after Svorono's book. And Leridaire studied three orts confiscated in Crete at the beginning of the century, analyzing also in depth some problems concerning Cretan coinages, such as the chronology and the phenomena of overstriking and countermarking that are quite spread all across the island. The other two volumes appeared more recently, respectively in 2019 and in 2020. The first is born from an exhibition concerning Cretan cities and their history throughout, throughout coins. And the second gathers the proceedings of a conference held in Athens in 2016 that gave the opportunity to rediscuss some issues concerning Cretan economy and society in Hellenistic period. 
To complete this list, we should add some works on specific means that appeared in recent years and that concern the cities of Polyrenia and Kidonia by Manolis Stefanakis, the city of Hierapetna by Vasiliki Stefanaki, and the mint of Pestos by Federico Carbone. It is useful, at least to mention, but not to go too in depth because it is too hard, that <clears throat> there are some issues on which the debate is still open. That is the chronology of the first Cretan coins, the weight standard in use on the island, at least at the beginning, <clears throat> and the diffusion of overstriking and countermarking, <clears throat> as I have already mentioned. Concerning chronology, the main problem is the absence of stratigraphical data to rely on that forces us to adopt other evidence to date the first coins. And indeed, you can find, for example, the first coins of Knossos swinging between 500 BC and 425 BC. Concerning the weight standard, it seems to be an agenetically based standard of about 11 grams, but the studies on the single means are showing that, of course, each city had its own, let's say, interpretation of it. And lastly, the wide diffusion of overstriking and countermarking in Crete had been already underlined by Lerider, who provided also a list of the samples he had found with these figures. In general, the, three, the last three points of this list are commonly explained looking at the absence of silver mines in Crete that would have, would have caused Cretan cities to use a debased standard, thus also preventing their coins to trespass the borders of the island, and to reuse foreign coins by overstriking and countermarking them so as to recycle somehow foreign silver. So, leaving apart all these problems that, however, are part of the broader scenario to which also Knossian, Knossian coins pertain, we will now pass to Knossos. I divided this conversation in three parts that correspond more or less to the different steps of my research, if and if, as you will see, the majority of the work implied a parallel consideration of the different issues. So, the first part will deal with the archaeological and historical context. That means the archaeology and history of Knossos in archaic, classical, and Hellenistic period. I mean, the phases that prepared the production of coins and the ones in which the production of coins occurred. The second part will concern the coins and their reorganization, taking into account the data already gathered by me and by the other before me. The third part, we try to put these coins in their proper place in the broader framework of history and economy of ancient Knossos and, of course, of ancient Crete. The attempt is to try to understand, on the one hand, what was the, the city of Knossos like when coins were produced, meaning not only the buildings of the city that, as we will see in a minute, are terribly scarce, but also the history and social components of the polis. On the other hand, once the coins are organized in a possibly proper order, one should ask what they were conceived for and how much room there was in Knossian and Cretan economy and society for coins. So, starting with the archaeological and historical context, of course, I moved throughout different levels that had history of excavations, archaeological records, ancient sources, and epigraphical texts. And as you can easily imagine, the collective imaginary concerning Knossos is, and was even in the past, strongly affected by the idea of King Menos reigning on the palace and building the labyrinth to imprison the Minotaur. As you remember, the myth talked about an horrible monster, half man and half bull, sent by Poseidon to punish Minos, who asked the genius and architect Daedalus to build a special maze to imprison the monster, which he in fact did. Well, the myth was obviously renowned through the centuries, and indeed, already in the 15th century, the Italian scholar Buondelmonti reminded it, attributing also to Minos the merit to be the inventor of coinage. And you have on the left one of the drawings of Bondelmonti in his Descriptio in Sulecrete. 
The first archaeological research in Knossos was conducted in 1878 by Minos Kalokairinos, who was a merchant from Heracleion. He uncovered some of the Western store rooms of the palace, donating one pedos from the excavations to some museums in Rome, in Paris, Athens, and so on. He kept the other finds in his own home in Heraklion, where they were destroyed, unfortunately, during the revolution in 1898. After these first discoveries, Knossos attracted, obviously, international attention. And indeed, the American consul Stillman, with Schliemann, Dörpfel, the French archaeologist Joubin, arrived in Crete in 1886, attempting unsuccessfully to buy the area of Kefala, that is the area where the palace lies, from its Turkish owners. But a few later, Arthur Evans arrived in Crete, determined on the archaeological conquer of the island. He soon thought about buying the land of Kefala, and after long negotiations, I have some letter here, he finally managed to acquire it, beginning the excavations with the permission of the Cretan state. Within three years, and you have on the left the permission of the Cretan state to the Air Force, stating that Evans had been granted permission to excavate Kefala. So, <clears throat> Within three years, the most of the palace came to light and the research continued intermittently until 1931. And just I put some pictures to make, for, make you have an idea. The world research was published in the monumental work in seven books of the Palace of Minos at Knossos. So, of course, we owe to Evans the discovery of the palace and its surroundings. But on the other hand, Evans was determined to uncover the most ancient levels of the city, and doing so, the later layers and all the stratigraphy concerning posterior phases went destroyed without any kind of documentation. Thus, the archaic, classical, Hellenistic, and later phases of Noxos are poorly known, at least in the area where the palace lies. This means, in turn, that we have no archaeological evidence of the city where Knossian coins were effectively minted, at least if we look at this zone of the settlement. However, after the Second World War, a new season of research was opened. The excavations were now led following the principles of stratigraphical method and were resumed by Sinclair Hood, who dug inside and outside the palace, drawing some accurate plans. Hood and Smith carried out fundamental survey in the area of the city that still constitutes an essential study tool. Lastly, a survey project, the Knossos Urban Land Landscape Project, was initiated by the British School of Athens in 2005, aiming to provide, and I'm quoting, a framework to synthesize previous archaeological research and to establish a comprehensive baseline for future research. Thanks to the surveys and to the excavations carried out in some of the sanctuaries, we can have at least an idea of the existence and extension of the city after the Minon Palace. Relying on the scarcity of archaeological marks, markers and evidence, it has been a long, long claim that around the 7th and 6th century BC, Knossos faced a phase of decline that is commonly labeled as the Archaic Gap, to be explained with some conflict with other settlements. The indicators of this gap, gap can be listed in three points. Of course, I'm simplifying a complex problem. That are the absence of pottery pertaining to the 6th century BC, the abandonment of the burials, and the abandonment, I added an apparent abandonment of the settlement. It must be said, however, that no traces of destruction have been found, found so far in Knossos, and so the idea of a war that destroyed the city seems not acceptable at all. Moreover, <clears throat> recent research, and I tried to sum up here some of the results, allowed to reconsider these issues. And the final result of all this, quoting Kotsonas, is that the large-scale spatial reorganization attested in cemeteries, sanctuaries, and settlements 
should be interpreted as the reflection of an important phenomenon usually described as the rise of the archaic police. So the apparent lack of evidence is probably to, relate, to be related with visibility and not with a real crisis of the city. Also, a glance to the beginning of the 5th century BC reveals scarce information concerning domestic architecture, but an increase in votive offerings in the sanctuaries or in the surroundings of the city. That also seems to indicate that the police exists at this time. Passing to the historical and epigraphical sources, I gathered them on this timeline. So you have archaeological evidence in blue, the historical sources in red, and the epigraphical data in green. So apart from some evidence concerning treaties in Hellenistic period that I also gathered in a single label, this one, because there were too many, uh, I did not omit anything. And so you can see by yourself that the evidence is really scarce. As you can see, an event that touches the whole island occurs at the very beginning of the classical period, that is the Persian Wars. Actually, the Cretans refused to take part in the wars, and it has been suggested that this refusal probably caused the island to be cut off from the mainstream odors of Greek history. That, of course, is a big issue for us, but on the other hand, explains the silence of ancient sources that thus should not be connected with a regression or conservatism of Crete, as sometimes has been suggested. Going on, we find that the observation on the rise of the police at the end of the 6th century seems somehow to be confirmed by the occurrence of astasis in Knossos around 470 BC. Astasis implies indeed a fight between two political parties, which seem to indicate a structured city. In the same years, we also have a treaty, more or less in the same years, we have a treaty with Argos and Tilesos, that is a, a small settlement near Knossos. Going on, as you can see, we can find some alliance and the most important event, we are here, well documented also by coins, it is the only case, is the war against Lithos. So to sum up with the general context, we have a framework, even if a bit faded, to put the coins in. We have some processes pre-announcing and preparing the rise of the polis in the 7th and 6th century BC, then some events that confirm the existence and consistence of the polis at the beginning of the 5th century, and then going towards the Hellenistic period, the alliance and war <coughs> that often characterized the political scenario of the 100 city Crete. Arriving to the coins, of course, I started from Svoronos catalog and tried to organize them, taking into account the framework on the one hand and the technical and iconographical features of the coins on the other. So I, I know it's a bit overcrowded, but <laughs> I want you to see that the timeless badge of the labyrinth was chosen as a coin type from the beginning to the end, and its different shapes and styles provide the easiest guide, not the only one, but the easiest guide to give an order to the single series. The coin production can be divided easily into main phases, more or less corresponding to the classical and Hellenistic periods. So, the first series of the classical period bear the Minotaur on the obverse and a labyrinth shaped as a swastika here, or sometimes as a maze on the reverse. As you can see, the monster on the obverse shows a very archaic rendering with a kneeling running position suggesting movement. This is a rendering that we can find on other coins, but also on gems, statues, pottery figures, and other elements such as the element, element pardon, of the archaic period. Mm. The monster also has perfect abdominal muscles, not too far from some stages of Kurui, and archaic long hair, not very visible here, I fear. The legend is retrograde with archaic fonts and reads Knosion, that is, of the Knosion. Well, if you think 
at the idea of the rise of the polis at the end of the sixth, beginning of the fifth century BC, one can imagine that one, stru that one structured, the city chose as, as its coin type a very recognizable badge that claims also for the pride of autonomy and self-consciousness of the city. According to the myth, the Minotaur was indeed fed with boys and girls that Athens was forced to send as payment to Minos. So behind the coin type, there is perhaps also the will to remark this mythical supremacy. Passing to the two series in the middle, these two, as you can see, we have here a shift from the swastika to the square labyrinth, while on the obverse, there is a female goddess that probably is Demeter. The last series I present on the right <coughs> for the classical period shows still the square labyrinth on the reverse and on the obverse, the head of Hera. Well, the interesting point here is that this coin type appears also on the coins of Argos, dated around 370 BC, more or less, and on the coins of Tilisos on the right. This is the small settlement I was mentioning before that lies near Knossos. As I mentioned before, we have a treaty between these three cities testified by two inscriptions found in Argos and Tilisos but the epigraph is dated to 450 BC. So one can imagine that these coins could be connected to some renewal of the treaty itself or to some new relationship that bound the three cities. We don't know. More or less around 300 BC, we find also the production of the first bronze coins, some of which bear the same types of the silver, helping us to place them at least in a relative chronology. The, the interesting point here is that the production of bronze is very abundant and seems to fill the gap left by a standstill, standstill pardon, in silver production, because after the coins with Hira, we have no silver for a long time. It is worth noticing before passing to the Hellenistic period that the first series and the last show different denominations probably produced to face expenses of different nature and amount. Moreover, the world production of classical period is minted following the debased genetic standard, perfectly in line with the rest of credentments. So passing to the Hellenistic period, the production of coins starts again around one, uh, pardon, 221 BC with bronze coins. Here we have the only case in Knossian coinage which shows a perfect correspondence with the historical framework. As you can see, the types chosen are the labyrinth and Europe on the bull, that is the coin type of Gortin. These coins are indeed produced on the occasion of the war against Lithos that Knossos and Gortin faced as allies. And this alliance is testified by the choice to produce coins with common types that we can easily suppose were minted exactly to face war expenses. Silver production stands still until 110 BC when we find the samples bearing a god on the obverse, probably Zeus or more probably Minos, and as usually the labyrinth on the reverse. Also this production, production is accompanied by some bronze with the same types. Not surprisingly, these coins are now minted according to the Attic standard because we are in the middle of the Hellenistic period and this is the most used. And we have also to remember that Knossos had political and probably economical relation <coughs> outside the island as the inscriptions testify. So the last series is really obscure in many respects. It is normally dated between 110 and 68 BC, but we have a lot of doubts on it. And we have Apollo on the obverse and the only case of uh, round labyrinth on the reverse. So we don't know quite anything about these coins. They uh, are all around 15 grams. And so the common opinion is that they were minted to reorient Knossian traffic towards the east and roads. Well, if we put all these series on a timeline, we have a first phase of production that involved obviously only silver coins, then flanked by the bronze. If we draw a line that simulates silver and bronze production, the silver is in light blue, the bronze in dark blue, 
it seems that when silver production stops or drops, it is somehow replaced by the bronze. At least one thing we can remark of all this is this, it is that the second peak, peak of bronze production is the only case for which we have not only a chronological date to pinpoint the main thing, that is, of course, the war, but also the main need these coins were produced for, for not surprisingly, a war. These considerations lead us to the third part of our conversation that is trying to explore the role of these coins in Knossian and Credan framework broadly intended. So also in this case, I explored different <laughs> approaches, production and circulation, so something strictly numismatical, and then social and political issues and the economies of Crete. So, Stepping back to the archaic period, this phase seems to prepare the conditions in which the coin was to be introduced in Crete. In recent years, some new data have been acquired that allow some considerations on the economic networks in which Cretan polis were involved. On the other hand, also the idea of a Cretan conservative society with a basic economy and reluctant to accept innovations as coinage has been discussed. Particularly significant in an economic perspective is the analysis led on the distribution on Laconian pottery in Crete in 6th and 5th century. Of course, I didn't do it, I just <laughs> accepted the results of others. These bases were indeed <clears throat> brought from Laconia to Northern Africa through a sea route that touched several ports of coal along the western coast of Crete. According to Bryce Erickson, the Laconic pottery found in Crete tips the scale in favor of a direct commercial link between the Peloponnese and Crete. During the stopover along the coast of Crete, it is possible that traders from the Peloponnese purchased locally produced pottery, which was then traded with the rest of the cargo along the coast of North Africa, where it was indeed sometimes found. Part of this route is also recorded by Thucydides, testifying its importance still in the late 5th century BC. So in the same years when the appearance of coinage occurs in Crete, <clears throat> we find that the island was at least implied in some international routes. Obviously, we can't state how actively, and it would be unfounded to imagine that these traffics imply the use of coins, but it stands the fact that Crete was not isolated at all. While the contacts outside the island are indicated at least in part by the marker of pottery distribution, less can be said about crafts and production inside the island. During the 7th and 6th century, however, we assist the creation of some social conditions and archaeological phenomena that seem to precede and prepare the rise of the polis. All this process is the framework for the introduction of coinage in Knossos that can be that can be placed more or less in the first quarter of the fifth century BC. It seems improper to look at these coins, these first coins at least, just as economic tools. As, as we have already mentioned, the first coins bearing the Minotaur and the labyrinth and proclaiming themselves as of the Knossians seems indeed to be the proud expression of a community well aware of herself and ready to remind through the, uh, through the midst of the Minotaur that there have been times when Nosos had a specific supremacy on Athens. Also, we saw that these coins were minted in different denominations that seem to imply different needs to be faced. In this respect, it is interesting to remind some inscriptions, not only from Nosos, but also from other Cretan polis, that concern fines to be paid in drafts, staters, obols. So a part of these coins should have been destined to an internal circulation. But concerning circulation, we have some interesting hints, thanks to the strikes that, as I mentioned, <coughs> was very common in Crete. Thanks to Lerider, we know six minotaurs overstruck on agenetic turtles. Four agenetic turtles were also found by Evans during the excavations of the palace. And this is his plan. It seems to be in, this seems to be in line with the data we dispose of for other settlements, for example, Gortin and Festos, 
and in general, the circulation of the genetic coins on the island is testified by the Madala hoard found on the southern coast of Crete that contained a good amount, a big amount indeed, of genetic coins. Other interesting hints come from the inscription of the treaty between Argos, Knossos, and Tilisos that we already mentioned. In this case, we read of a fine to be paid in studders, while other indications are given on taxes to be paid on import and export. We should not necessarily think that these taxes were to be paid with coins at all, but it is interesting to underline that the treaty offers the first example of a practice that is well documented in Hellenistic period, that is the custom to impose taxes on sea trades. So, quoting Didier Vivier, the establishment of the same conditions for both Knossians and Tilison citizens with regard to exports from Knossos and the establishment of a custom free trade between the two cities suggests that these issues had been subject to a acrimonious controversy in the recent past. And this could mean that a lack of such regulations would be the cause of grave imbalance. Going back to the coin circul circulations in the fourth and, and third century BC, the hordes attest the, pre the presence of coins coming from Corinth, Boeotia, Cyrenaica, and in a minor quantity from Argos. Along with the data from the hordes from the late fourth century onwards, we also dispose of some evidence from stratigraphical research. The excavations at the sanctuary of the Metro at Nossos, indeed, reveal the presence of silver and bronze coins of Argos, silver coins from Cyrene, Rhodes, and Athens, and similar results we have also from the excavations at the unexplored mansion in Knossos. The ways in which foreign coins reached Cretan Polis have not been clarified at all, but it seems likely that commercial exchanges, along with the movement of people, merchants, or mercenaries for first, favored the influx of coinage from overseas. And one can recall in this case, the presence of mercenaries specifically attested to Knossos at the end of the fourth century we saw in the timeline before. Concerning the second and first century BC, some hordes found in the territory of Knossos, pardon, I forgot to, to change. These are the coins from the Sanctuary of Demeter. So concerning the second and first centuries BC, some hordes found in the territory of Knossos indicate that the polis was then in commercial and political relations with several cities. The hordes revealed coins from Sishon, Argos, the Achaean League, Rhodes, and of course, from other Cretan polis. Perhaps the frequent presence of Rhodian coins should be connected with the political relations between the two polis, attested by epigraphical and historical sources that could have implied economic, economic contacts too. Furthermore, the mercenaries and colonists moving towards from Asia Minor could have contributed to the movement of coins as well. And in this sense, we can recall the coins with Apollo and the round labyrinth, whose weight has been reconnected with Rhodian traffic. But the number of coins known is really low, so we must be really very cautious. So between 4th and 1st century BC, the economy, economic activities are regulated by numerous treaties, thus the cultivation of land, circul circulation and exchange of previously stored goods, pasturings of flocks, appear to have been important economic activities, alongside with the export by sea and by land, which was normally subject to duties. Once again, the relevance accorded to, to taxation of maritime goods suggests the importance of, of gains made through taxes on overseas commodities, indirectly confirming the role as a commercial port of call played by Cretan cities. The possibility to envisage an active role of Cretan polis in this trade circuit, however, remains in doubt. It has been suggested that the fact that goods exported from the island cities are not archaeologically attested, apart from ceramics, of course, is due to the perishability of the products in question. 
and some scanty hint in this sense comes from literary sources that recall the good quality of Cretan wood, particularly cypress, used for constructions of gates and temple roofs. To this observation, one can add Vivier's hypothesis that there is a possibility that goods from Highland being traded by foreign intermediaries were not recognized as credents. Among the activities listed by inscriptions, we also find texts mentioning lending and borrowing money at interest. So it is very hard to find the place for coins, but uh, somehow they would have been used in some of these transactions. Not all of them, of course, but maybe some of them. Turning to Knossos, the decision to produce coins could have been the response not only to commercial needs, but also to other necessities of the polis, such as administration, we saw it, the payment of mercenaries, probably, and war expenses, <coughs> war expenses. And we saw that in some cases, it seems possible to connect Gnosian coins to one of these issues. The production of different denominations, along with the adoption of bronze coinage, seem to imply a quite monetized economy. Furthermore, the data collected so far allow to acknowledge some moments of intense work of the Gnosian mint, along with others of apparently absolute stillness maybe indicating that the coins already in circulation were enough to meet the needs of the police at that time. To conclude, maybe, it seems that even if many questions remain obviously open, the historical framework Gnostian coins were minted in seems to be more or less consistent with coin production. Vice versa, coins themselves seems to be a good autonomous historical source that sometimes accompanies and sometimes supplies the history of the city when we lack of other information. Also, we can recognize in some cases the needs these coins were minted for that seem to be social and especially during the Hellenistic period, economic and maybe political. So what there is still to do? Well, on the one hand, we can progressively abandon the idea of a conservative society with a basic economy that refuses the use of coins. Insularity does not mean isolation and conservatism at all. And last but not least, the creation of a complete corpus and a die study will be, I believe, fundamental not only to go in depth with the economic policy of Knossos, if any, but some, somehow there was, but also to add another little piece to the puzzle, the scholars are slowly composing with the main studies in Crete. Very much. Uh, thank you, Claudia, for uh, Dr. Devoto for this uh, very good presentation. Thanks so much. I don't know, uh, there is a lot uh, to ask. I have a lot of questions myself, uh, but before I do so, I want to open uh, uh, the field to possible questions, if there are any. I cannot see any questions in the chat here, So, but I, uh, so if anybody wants to ask questions, you can directly, or I will begin. Any, no questions? Okay, then I can have, uh, okay. So um, I have, uh, first of all, uh, um, some questions about uh, the role uh, of uh, Rhodian coinage in Crete, uh, because um, I mean, of course, apart from the presence of Rhodian coinage, uh, we also have, uh, uh, the production of the so-called pseudo-Rhodian uh, uh, drums on Crete. Could you please uh, tell us more about this? And me, because this is my personal pleasure. Well, <laughs> I don't have the answer, but I can say you're perfectly right saying that we have also imitations, not only in Knossos, but also in other polis. And well, 
not to go too far because the, the problem with creed in general and with no source also, of course, is that you risk to contaminate different uh, set of data, of course. So in this case, uh, I, I won't go too far saying that we have so politic uh, relationships between knossos and droughts. And so maybe there are also economic relationships that we cannot trace at all, but can be suggested by the presence of coins. But I, I wouldn't dare to go too far with this, with the knowledge that we have now. But of course, the, prob the big problem is, uh, but in general, in this scenario, that the only marker for exchanges is coins on the one end and on the other pottery. And if we lack both of them, you, you can try to reconstruct some framework, but you, can, you can't go too in depth without, let's say contamination or exaggerating, forcing the data, I think. Okay, I, I have a question because of course I would like to follow up on this, but we have a question from Peter Tampa. How did you determine numbers of bronze versus silver coins shown in the charts? Is this based uh, on an estimate of coins struck from known dice? Well, they were not charts at all. I, I, I expressly chose the word lines because they were not actually charts. Well, for the bronze, I have to say there have been uh, two fundamental study by Anne Jackson that uh, indeed is the one who tried to put them in order and they follow it a order because of course with bronze, first of all, we have to see the coins and they didn't see them at all, of course, but the amount is really high and the types we can recognize are a lot. And this of course speaks for a possibility to calculate a big amount for bronze. But for silver, it is more or less easier because uh, the majority of them, are, as you can easily imagine, are in museums. And so even without going here and there, you, you can have more or less an idea. But the fact there in the chart, is, in the chart that is not a chart, <laughs> is that you have uh, the, and let's say when you have silver, you don't have bronze. When you have bronze, silver does not exist, more or less. It's not, of course, it's not so linear, but it seems to me that the idea behind it is exactly this one. So when they start with bronze, they stop with silver. And indeed, if you think about it, the series in the middle, the series, the series when bronze starts has no smaller denominations. There are only stutters, stutters and bronze. So it's like an experiment probably in that moment. And I can add to this that uh, we have a decree in Gortin that forces persons to accept payments in bronze. So at the very beginning, maybe Cretans did not like bronze very much. So, and, but later on, we see that they, they uh, minted a lot of coins in bronze. But at the very beginning, it must, be, must have been something not too well accept. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, from Joel Allen. So is Joel Allen, is the reverse type of the labyrinth in the Gnosian coins the earliest such representation in antiquity? No, absolutely no. And indeed we have, thank you for this question, it's very interesting. Uh, we have in uh, Evan's books, we have a lot of notes when where he tries to find parallels between the coins and a lot of draws he found before. So in, in, the, in the levels uh, going with the palace. So <laughs> in very, very before the beginning of Cretan coinage. Hi. So it's very nice because he puts in the same pages sometimes gems and coins, but not gems, not Greek gems, but Minon gems. So. It's very nice. Okay. Um, no other uh, questions uh, I see. Okay. What do you think, uh, Dan? Uh, sorry, Dan, I have to. What do you think about the 
so-called existence of these uh, Cretan standard, this sort of Cretan standard that uh, supposedly existed in second, first century BC and yeah. So, Do you think it exists? Thank or you not? again because we are going in depth with some things I couldn't touch because, of course, there was not mm -hmm. enough time. So, the idea of the label of Cretan standard is in use, some scholars use it, but mm -hmm. well, I, I don't find it too necessary to use it. Of course, we can, it, it's widely known that in Crete we have a debased standard. Okay. We can call it Cretan standard if we want, but or we can call it a debased a genetic standard. The idea of the concept of Cretan standard makes me think about a shared policy all across the island. Yes. And in this case, I, I would not say that it is a shared policy. It's just something like a phenomenon that starts somewhere, we don't know where, and that it spreads in the island. Once the first police started to mint coins using that standard, of course, the others were influenced by it. By it, I think it's it's a like when you uh, when you put the stone in the water, it's a phenomenon that enlarges itself. Okay. Now, also because this Cretan standard is used for the reduced genetic standard, and then it's used for the reduced static yeah. standard, uh, yeah. uh, then uh, in the second, first century. So basically, it's like a catch all. Uh, yeah, a catch -all, uh, yeah and, and it's not so special because we have other contexts in which, in which we have a, a genetic standard that is debased. So, how can we possibly identify it with something that is? only Cretan, it's not only Cretan, it's something that happens when you go far and farther from the center that in this case is Aegina, I think. Yes. Okay. Um, do we have, uh, of course, I can ask you about Sistofori, but I will not for now because I don't want <laughs> to, to bore the people, poor people here. Um, are we have, do we have any other questions for uh, Dr. Devoto? It doesn't seem uh, so. So I'll uh, I'll ask you about Sistofori later on. And uh, for now, really, thank you very much. Uh, no, thank you for hosting me. And, and thank this you was, all for uh, the really answers. A great presentation. You presented a lot of uh, very diverse uh, evidence. So this was. A lot of fun for us. So thank you very, I very much. So. Really. Thank you. Ciao, thank Claudia. You.